Okay, so for this very first chapter, it's called Abnormal Behavior in Historical Context. We're going to review um, some of the basics of what makes behavior um, abnormal. So first off, when we start to think about psychological disorders, there is no single definition of psychological abnormality, just as there's no single definition of psychological normality. So we have to think about these two terms in, in regard to what's happening in society. So when it comes to a psychological disorder, first off, we're going to look at how is the person functioning from a cognitive standpoint, emotional standpoint, and a behavioral standpoint. Anytime cognition, which always refers to thinking, emotions, having to do with feelings and behavioral functioning, which has to do with your actions. Anytime that's outside of what's considered societal or cultural norms, then we think of it as a psychological dysfunction or therefore abnormality. When a person is experiencing psychological dysfunction or a psychological disorder, they might have impairment in a number of different areas. They could have relationship problems, problems in their job, difficulty completing their daily routines. They may not um, feel up to par. They could experience their own level of psychological distress. And that's what eventually leads them to seeking out some type of help. So if you look in the picture, you can see that when we think of a psychological disorder, we want to think of how dysfunctional is the person, their cognition, their emotions, and their behaviors how distressing um, or how much impairment are they experiencing? And then what is their response? How atypical is it? So one definition that has been acceptable for describing a psychological dysfunction is having distress or impairment in function that is not typical or culturally expected. So what is considered psychological dysfunction today may not have been viewed as psychological dysfunction 50 years ago. And likewise, what was considered psychological dysfunction 50 years ago may not be considered psychological function today because as society changes, so does what is culturally expected or acceptable. So the way we diagnose psychological disorders is using a book called the DSM, and we're on the fifth version. And DSM refers to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And um, this book will tell us all of the criteria that's necessary for quantifying a psychological disorder. It's going to tell us the symptoms to look for. And throughout this course, we're going to explore different parts of the DSM um, so that you can see what criteria are for certain disorders. My apologies for that. Um, and then after we look at some criteria for the DSM, you'll be able to see what quantifies as a disorder and what does not. So this fifth version of the DSM was first um, was released in May of 2013, and they're currently, I believe, working on a revised version of that as well that should be released. But for now, most clinicians are probably working from the DSM-5. And the field of psychopathology is the scientific study of a psychological disorder, and that's what this abnormal psychology class will be about. So when it comes to those who can treat uh, psychopathology, you're going to look at mental health professionals who are versed in how to handle those disorders. So people with a PhD in clinical or counseling psychology have been trained in research and delivering treatment. Um, individuals with a PsyD, which is a doctor, doctor of psychology degree, they can have that degree in clinical and counseling psychology, and they are trained in delivering treatment. I have my doctorate of psychology, and in my training program, I worked a lot with treating psychological disorders. It was less research. It was more clinical, more practical experience. 
And then you have your medical doctors or your MDs, and they are psychiatrists who probably work on in hospitals with mental health um, wings, or they could work in state hospitals, or they work with clients who are suffering from some type of psychological disorder. A psychiatrist is the only person who can prescribe medication for a psychological disorder. So oftentimes a psychologist or a counselor has to work in conjunction with a psychiatrist to make sure that patients are receiving the care they need. We also have psychiatric nurses who are nurses who work in psychiatric facilities like hospitals or um, inpatient facilities, and they are well versed in treating psychological disorders as well as um, psychiatric social workers who also can serve as counselors and can help uh, deliver treatment because they've also been trained in how to treat psychological disorders. So if you are interested in working within the field of mental health, you can see there are a lot of different career choices you can choose to go into. So the science practitioner model is the model we use whenever we want to treat disorders. So when we deliver treatment and we look at research, we can see that both the treatment and the research are going to influence each other. So all mental health professionals have to stay current with research in the field. They have to know whether or not the treatment methods they want to use with their clients are in their best interest. And oftentimes many clinicians will also conduct research so that whatever area they are in most interested in, they constantly have information. So when we think about the field of psychology, we have to think of uh, psychologists and mental health professionals as science scientists, practitioners, because we do think of the field as being based in science. And there are three major categories that make up what a mental health professional will do. First off, you have to be a consumer of science. So you have to try to enhance your practice and do the research. And you also have to be able to evaluate science. So is this effectively working in practice the way I want it to? If a treatment method it's not what's in the best interest of a client. What can I do to change it, to make it better? And then you also have to be a creator of science. That means you need to conduct some research that can help the field and lead to new procedures that people can use whenever they are practicing with clients. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to you guys about when we are describing something clinically, how we can do that. So if we are a mental health professional and we have someone who comes to see us for treatment, it's always going to start with a presenting problem. Okay. So when somebody comes into therapy, they're there for a reason. So what is that a reason? It could be a symptom like I'm worrying too much. I'm having panic attacks or I'm way too sad. Um, I'm having relationship issues. There's always some type of presenting problem that starts the discussion. By accurately describing what the presenting problem is, we can then figure out, okay, is this a normal human experience or is this something that's dysfunctional and abnormal from somebody else's experience of a disorder? So by getting, gathering all of this information, we want to be able to look at how prevalent the issue is and how much of an instance of these disorders we're seeing in society. When mental health professionals are trying to determine what's going on with someone's disorder, they also have to look at the onset of the disorder. Is it something that's acute or very new? As in, this has been a symptom that's been happening for maybe 30 days or less. Or is it something that's insidious and something, that, something that's kind of been more gradual? How did this come about? You also have to be able to describe the course of the disorder. Is it just one specific ap episode? Is it something that's more time limit or has it been ongoing and happening for a while? And then they also have to consider the prognosis. Is this a good prognosis that we think someone will easily recover from? 
or is the prognosis more guarded? Meaning is my prognosis something that I'm doubtful will actually get better? When it comes to the etiology of a disorder, we have to think about the different things that could contribute to what creates psychopathology. And, you know, for each person, it could be a number of different things. One of the biggest debates that exists in the field of psychology is the nature nurture debate. And is it more of our genetic factors, our um, nature that has more of an impact on who we are? Or is it more of our environment or our nurture that plays more of a role in who we are? We know that diet, uh, we know that, you know, sleep patterns, we know that a number of different factors can contribute to the development of psychopathology. And once we sort of figured out what caused something, then we can also figure out how are we going to treat it? How can we help reduce or eliminate the psychological suffering a person experiences? And for some people, that might mean medication, or it could mean I'm going to teach you some coping skills that you can use and apply to various aspects of your life. And in some instances, we may need to combine medication with talk therapy to help a client improve. When it comes to research on different treatment out options, we have to know whether or not what we've done has helped. And research is a way for us to do that. It can be difficult at times to target specific causes of disorders. So instead, um, much of what the DSM is going to talk about is the symptoms, because those symptoms can be targeted. Whereas for everybody, that ideology, that specific cause can be quite different. So if we go back over the history of psychology, major psychological disorders have been around in every culture for a long time, you know, long period of time people have suffered from psychological disorders. Even though it might seem to you that people are suffering more now, I mean, it's probably part of that, you know, you actually exist during this time period. So, you know, as we grow and age and we tend to think things are worse in our generation, but things have been around for a while. Um, there also can be different causes and treatment of the abnormal behavior. And that is going to vary depending on culture, depending on the time period, depending on worldviews. So just as society changes, treatment methods for different disorders will change as well. No matter what, there has been three dominant traditions that have existed in how we explain abnormal behavior. We can explain it supernaturally, biologically, and psychologically. So when it comes to the supernatural tradi tradition, this is when we look at deviant behavior as a battle of good versus evil. Um, you know, sort of some of those early, early theor theories are that when a person was suffering from a psychological disorder, it was caused by demonic possession and witchcraft and sorcery. And that's when people were treated with exorcisms and torture and religious services. Also, you know, mass hysteria, which um, had to do with you know, people just believing that all of these deviant behaviors were going to cause people to do things that were completely different from what would be expected of them. That explains mob psychology and e emotion contagion and looking at the moon and the stars and thinking that, you know, different faces of the moon or faces of the stars could create, you know, lunacy and, different abnormal behaviors in people. From a biological perspective, um, if we look at the Galenic and Hippocratic tradition, um, we can look at the moral theory of disorders, which says that function is, functioning is related to having too much or too little of four key bodily fluids or the four humors, including blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. So the idea behind this is, you know, depression could be caused by having too much black bile. And we could treat these things using environmental conditions like reducing heat or having vomiting or bloodletting. So from a biological standpoint, um, that was how a lot of 
etiology of disorders was viewed. In the 19th century, syphilis and um, was linked to madness in individuals. Several people thought of mental illness as physical illness. And um, when the psychological and behavioral symptoms presented themselves, people looked at, okay, it's a bacterial microorganism and we need to treat it just the same way we would treat any other medical condition. And that's what led to penicillin being a treatment for a psychological symptom. So that told us that mental illness was just physical illness. John Gray was a psychiatrist who believed that mental illness had its roots in physical symptoms. And he really was a champion of the biological tr tradition in the United States. And he even helped some hospitals reform themselves to give psychiatric patients better care during the 19th century. We've also had some people uh, treated for psychological symptoms using electric shock therapy, crude surgery, um, having insulin injections, which was really discovered by accident um, as a way to calm a psychi psych psychotic patients. Um, patients have also been given major and minor tranquilizers. Um, and we still can give tranquilizers like benzodiazepines today uh, for patients who are suffering from anxiety. So as a result of the biological condition, we view mental illness as physical illness, and that's how it was classified. And it emphasized to us that different disorders can have unique times of onset, symptoms, and causes. From the psychological tradition, this is when there was more of a rise in moral therapy. It first started around the 19th century, and that moral therapy um, has to do with treating those psychological and emotional factors. So what's going on inside of a person? This was the idea that we, if we treat patients as normally as possible in a normal environment, then their level of psychological and emotional factors will increase. This led to more humane treatment of those who were institutionalized as seeing people as people and not as, you know, people who don't have any rights. And it also encouraged and reinforced the social interaction that so many patients who are institutionalized need. So there were a number of proponents of moral therapy. Um, Dor Dorothea Dix, for example, um, really fought for mental the mental hygiene movement and having sanitary conditions for those who um, suffered from mental disorders. You also had Benjamin Rush, who worked a lot to lead some reforms in the United States. We had Felipe Penal and um, Jean-Baptiste Poussin, who thought that patients shouldn't be restrained. And if we're really thinking about the morality of therapy, we do have to treat people as people and not objects. This also led to um, an increase in asylum reform which meant more patients were getting care and um, eventually moral therapy declined because as the population of people needing help grew, it was harder to provide the services they need. And that eventually led to alternative psychological methods being created. Starting with like the psychoanalytic perspective and Sigmund Freud, who thought that the unconscious mind was the source of everything that happened in our lives. He wanted to look at catharsis and having this release of things that cause anxiety or distress. Um, and this psychoanalytic theory sought to explain, you know, how we develop and how our personality grows. Freud also told us that the mind, the personality can be shaped by age five and is structured using the id, the ego and the superego the id being the part of the brain that's responsible for our desire to say me, 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 give me pleasure. Um, it's kind of animalistic in nature and um, irrational and it wants what it wants when it wants it. And um, the super ego, of course, are your moral principles. It's kind of the 
good angel on one shoulder, the bad angel uh, or the devil on the other shoulder and how we can go back and forth in our morality. And of course, the ego is the part of the personality of the mind that is more rational and is based in reality and has to mitigate and mediate between the super ego and the id because the id wants what it wants. The super ego only wants to do things that are based on morality and the ego has to look at reality and say, this is why we should behave this way. Freud also came up with the term defense mechanisms, which he said was the ego's attempt to manage the anxiety experience. There are a number of different defense mechanisms that we all use to explain situations, such as displacement, when we take the anger we're feeling towards something and we put it on somebody else who might not be deserving of that. Denial, when we don't accept the ego-threatening truth. We can also use rationalization when we try to come up with something favorable for a situation that may not be in our favor. And we can also have reaction formation where we express, express the opposite of how we truly feel. Um, we can have projection, which is when we put the feelings we have about something onto somebody else. We can repress things that we don't wanna think about and bury and put out of our mind. And we can use sublimation as sort of a healthy way to cope with something bad that's happened to us so that we can move on and we can channel our energy in another way. And so according to Freud, we use all of these different defense mechanisms to protect ourselves from anxiety. He also said that we develop using psychosexual stages. And according to Freud, um, the oral, anal, phallic, latency, and genital stages I always tell students to remember those five stages by the mnemonic, only adults play love games. And it is a way to think about Freud's stages of psychosexual development so that you remember all five parts. And according to him, as our id, ego, and super ego develop, we also develop sexually. Anna Freud, Sigmund Freud's daughter, also had some views about um, the ego and um, said that the ego has plays a vital role in defining our behavior. Other psychologists as well um, em emphasize how sometimes different objects um, can impact who we are. And so the object relations theorists believe that children are able to incorporate or interject objects into their understanding and these objects and images and memories will create value for them. Other neo-Freudians, people who kind of got away from Freud's view of uh, personality and development, emphasize the fact that other factors, such as social factors, were much more important than sexual factors in describing personality and behavior. So some of the neo-Freudians were um, Paul Young and Alfred Adler and Karen Harney and Fromm and Eric Erickson. And they all emphasized something different and they were considered neo-Freudians because they did not believe in Freud's psychosexual stages of development and how he viewed the ego. So eventually, you know, psychoanalytic theory being sort of one of those early perspectives um, it sought to unearth the hidden intrapsychic uh, conflicts that exist in a person. And um, people who go to psychoanalytic therapy oftentimes do so for a very long period of time. They may engage in what Freud called free association, where you lay down on a couch, you talk about whatever's on your mind, and it eventually reveals things that could be problematic in your life. Um, they can sometimes experience transference and countertransference, and transference happens when you go to a therapy session and the therapist um, reminds you of somebody else you know, and you transfer the feelings you have towards that other person onto the therapist. And countertransference happens when the therapist, who is also human, also is reminded of somebody when they work with you. And in that instance, you might remind them of somebody and they might also transfer the feelings they have towards somebody else onto you. 
And in most instances where a therapist experiences countertransference, it's better for them to refer or to get a different therapist to work with that client so that there's an objectivity. And um, there's been very little evidence of the efficacy of the talking cure and psychoanalytic theory. Humanistic theory says that people are basically good and they're always striving towards self-actualization. Two of the major humanistic theorists were Abraham Maslow, who created his hierarchy of needs, and Carl Rogers, who said that you know, in order to be self-actualized, we need three conditions to be appropriate, and that is empathy, acceptance, um, and we also need people to be real with us and, and give us authenticity. So person-centered therapy was one branch of therapy that came out of the humanistic perspective. And this is when a therapist conveys empathy and unconditional positive regard. There's very little therapist um, interpretation. It's just rephrasing of thoughts. There's also no strong evidence that purely humanistic therapies work to help cure mental disorders. It's more of people dealing with normal stresses that may not be something that's considered pathology. The behavioral perspective takes a scientific approach to the study of uh, psychopathology. These are with things like classical conditioning with Ivan Pavlov and John Watson. This is, um, has to do with learning and how we associate different things with each other and how we can condition people to fear or to do whatever it is we want to do. We can ring a bell and make a dog salivate. So when the behaviorist theory first came along, it challenged psychoanalysis and non-scientific approaches. And uh, Joseph Wolpe used systematic desensitization as a way to create the behaviors he wanted to see. So he started with um, training a person on how to deal with their anxiety and then gradually exposing them to whatever thing it was that they feared. So that eventually they no longer feared it. Operant conditioning has to do with um, rewards and punishment, um, something that's often used by parenting and the school system and things like that to either strengthen or decrease the behavior. And all of these um, sort of learning theories, uh, learning traditions influence the development of behavioral therapy, which was time directed, uh, time limited. There's strong evidence for the fact that behavioral therapy actually works because we can associate two things together. We can actually see the results from it. So when we think about an integrative approach, we have to remember that psychopathology is um, determined in a lot of ways. Um, many, we must consider like reciprocal relationships between neuroscience, cognitive science, behavioral science, and developmental science. We have to be able to define abnormal behavior as complex and multifaceted and having evolved over time. We also must realize that science, the science of psychopathology is evolving. Um, it's integrative, it's multidimensional, and we're constantly learning new things and looking at research. So I hope this um, lecture is helpful for you and your understanding of the first chapter of the textbook.